Okay, I think it's um, 102 on my clock. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everybody for joining today. My name is Michael Spinar and I'm the Lakewide Action and Management Plan or LAMP Program Coordinator for Indiana. On behalf of the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, I'd like to welcome everyone to the third in a series of 10 free webinars on topics anticipated to be of interest to the watershed protection and restoration community. Just so that everyone is aware, this session is being recorded. When the time comes for today's question and answer session, you will, you will be able to unmute yourself. If you would prefer, there's a chat window at the bottom of the screen in which you may type any questions you may have. This webinar series is anticipated to run from now through February to coincide with the development of the 2020 to 2024 Lake Michigan LAMP. Once released, the LAMP will report out on the state of Lake Michigan and its ecosystem with respect to the nine high level general objectives of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between the United States and Canada. And perhaps more importantly, will document the action priorities to be undertaken by the 21 federal, tribal, state, and local agencies and organizations document, uh, comprising the Lake Michigan partner, Lake Partnership to assess, protect, and restore lake, the lake and its ecosystem. Just like the forthcoming LAMP, this webinar series is targeted toward a broad audience, including watershed groups, MS4 coordinators, environmental organizations, land trusts, and members of the public. Each webinar will be scheduled for approximately 60 minutes from 1 to 2 p.m. Central or 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time, unless otherwise noted. Please refer to items Lake Michigan webinar series webpage, which I will post in the chat window for the latest scheduling updates and recordings of past presentations. Now, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Birchfield and Lynn Westfall. Jennifer is the ambassador for the Northwest Indiana Urban Waters Federal Partnership. And Lynn is a research social scientist for the US Forest Services Northern Research Station. Jen, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, Michael. Yes, I, I was muted. My, my um, pets tend to be noisy. So <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Michael, for inviting us here today to share a bit about uh, Northwest Indiana uh, Urban Waters Federal Partnership. Um, I am going to try sharing my, my slides here. Okay, is everyone able to see my slides? Okay. We can see them. Okay, great. Thank you, Michael. We'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so today's webinar will focus on uh, the Northwest Indiana Urban Waters uh, Federal Partnership. Um, so we'll start off by covering uh, the urban waters as a federal uh, partnership. We'll talk a bit about the history of urban waters here in Northwest Indiana, which is one of the 20 uh, urban waters federal partnership locations. We will talk about the annual work plan and how we use it. We'll detail some of the key Northwest Indiana Urban Waters initiatives. And finally, I'll say a few words about my role as the Northwest Indiana Urban Waters Coordinator. Um, so with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Lynn Westfall with US Forest Service. Um, she has been with uh, Urban Waters here in Northwest Indiana since the very uh, beginning days of the partnership. So I thought it would be fitting for her to give a little bit of a background um, as long as her internet uh, allows her to do so. And if not, I'll take over. Lynn? Yep, thanks, Jen. And yeah, my internet, I don't know if other people are having this freeze up, but Jen will just seamlessly pick up if I get frozen out. So Urban Waters, um, the partnership began hmm, eight, 10 years ago now, uh, is a national initiative aiming at um, several key issues. One is breaking down silos between different federal agencies so that they would work together more effectively and efficiently with each other. But the reason for that is to be able to engage local communities and be much better support to local initiatives, local groups, local concerns. With a 
focus on restoring urban waterways and revitalizing the communities that live near and along them. Next slide, Jen. So in the beginning of this whole process, there was a lot of work developing um, sort of what different do we want to do with urban waters? And that included developing these guiding principles be fundamental across all of the different urban water local partnerships like the one in Northwest India. And so principles are urban waters to people in their ways to encourage water conservation, but we also had guiding principles around how we would show up as we do this work. And that as a federal agency is gonna be open and honest and listen to communities, communities lead, we assist, focus on measuring results with future success, which is actually a very tough nut to try and crack. Um, emphasize urban as a way to promote economic revitalization and prosperity. So the water matters, but so do the communities and to encourage community improvements through active partnerships. And the next slide. There are a ton of agencies in, involved in this. And to me, this is one of the main things that makes the Urban Waters Partnership different from many similar um, initiatives within the federal government, where it's often the environmental agencies, Interior, Ag, EPA coming together. But with this partnership, we've also got the CDC, Department of Education and Energy, um, the Army Corps, Homeland Security, there's a whole list of agencies here and more. Um, one that is key for our area within ag is also the um, NRCS, and we'll talk a little bit about them later on. But the point is many agencies talking together, working together, and finding that we each have a strength that fills in another agency's weakness with helping on the ground. Next. So when this began, there were seven partnerships around the country. Northwest Indiana was one of the initial seven. Um, the one down in um, Phoenix is the brand new baby partnership. Jen? One of the exciting things that happened about four years ago, um, Urban Waters won the SAMI Award, which is pretty geeky to get excited about it. Um, it the SAMIs are the Service to America medals, and they're sort of the Oscars for federal service. Um, and along with the specific a piece of choice word where programs are voted for nationally and Urban Waters Partnership won. Quite achievement and something that made us all feel very good. Um, and some of the key folks that are new from numerous agencies that helped get this program going. Next, Jen. Okay, now I think we're handing it back to Jen. Yes, thank you so much, Lynn. Um, I find it very uh, helpful to get that background information on kind of the history of urban waters and, and how things got started here in Northwest Indiana from you um, as you've been around uh, since the, the very early, um, even the first days. Um, so as Lynn mentioned, uh, Urban Waters is a federal partnership with uh, locations active across the entire nation. Um, but of course, here today, we're going to talk about our location, which is Northwest Indiana. Um, so some of you might be uh, fairly familiar with this geography, but just in case you're not, um, we have a map here showing Northwest Indiana and its waterways and watersheds. Um, and this is the geography where uh, the Northwest Indiana Urban Waters uh, Partnership is primarily active. Um, um, generally in the waterways that drain to Lake Michigan in Northwest Indiana. Um, so we have several tributaries that um, we are active in as a partnership from Trail Creek, 
um, Little Calumet River, uh, both east and west branches of that river, Salt Creek, Deep River, and of course the Grand Calumet River. Um, so an interesting geography, certainly, of course, we're, we're located just south of Chicago around the Lake Michigan shoreline. Um, a lot of sort of post-industrial communities here. Um, we do have the Grand Calumet River area of concern um, over near the state line in Lake County. Um, but I'll also point out that we have a diversity of communities here. Um, generally, um, our headwater regions of um, these watersheds being more rural and then more urban um, up at the confluence with Lake Michigan. And we also have um, some amazing natural areas and, and um, great biodiverse areas such as, of course, the Indiana Dunes National Park um, listed here as the National Lakeshore, but recently um, designated as a national park. So for the Northwest Indiana location, it was, as Lynn mentioned, one of the original Urban Waters Federal uh, Partnership pilot locations back in 2011. Um, our location is uh, somewhat unique in that uh, we are co-led by three different federal agencies as opposed to just one. We are co-led by US EPA, US Forest Service, and National Park Service. Um, as of this year, we do have um, over 80 partners. Um, those include federal partners, um, as, as Lynn mentioned, the, the Urban Waters Federal Partnership partners, um, but also state partners, local partners, municipalities, not-for-profit organizations, industrial partners um, engaged at our location. Um, and my role as the, um, you know, sometimes we call it the coordinator, sometimes the ambassador, but um, my position is housed um, locally at Purdue Northwest. Um, so I wanted to share the urban waters work plan and, and sort of use that to structure the presentation today. Um, our, our work plan is developed with partner um, input annually. Um, it is drafted by myself generally by the ambassador um, with help from our local partners who provide input on, on different sections of the plan. Um, and then of course reviewed and modified together with our partners. Um, I do always include the previous year accomplishments so we can sort of see over time how these um, projects are um, progressing. Um, and I, I will point out that um, the work plan includes key projects that advance the urban waters goals in Northwest Indiana. Some of those are directly initiated by urban waters. Some of them are really driven more by our local partners with urban waters sort of playing a support role. Um, so I, I like to point that out so that we can be sure to give credit where credit is due. We have a lot of partners working a lot on a lot of projects here in Northwest Indiana. Um, and you can see the link here to um, the EPA Urban Waters website. The, the um, 2020 work plan is available at that website under the Northwest Indiana page, as well as previous year's work plans. Why is the work plan important? Um, we do develop it annually with our partner input and um, really it serves to communicate our priorities um, at the Northwest Indiana location level to urban water leadership at the federal level. Um, it gives me, you know, myself and what we call our core team, um, that being the US Forest Service, National Park Service and US EPA, some direction on our focus and our activities to make sure those are in line with um, the priorities of Northwest Indiana uh, partner organizations. Um, when resources and opportunities do become available, the work plan is a place where we can look um, and see those project lists and, and try to connect um, local projects and priorities to resources. And it helps me to keep out an eye um, for grants, assistant, and other opportunities that may be relevant to our local partners working in Northwest Indiana. So just a few of the key initiatives, and this is um, generally taken from the work plan, the major sections of the work plan um, that we'll talk about today. Um, we'll talk about public accessibility, watershed education, septic systems, the community program, and of course, supporting local watershed efforts that tend to be led by our, our local partners. So public accessibility was something that really rose to the top very early in um, the Urban Waters Federal Partnership in Northwest Indiana. Um, we are fortunate in Northwest Indiana to have a very um, active um, paddling association, the Northwest Indiana um, Paddling Association. And um, in the very early days, um, it, it became apparent that 
public accessibility, paddling accessibility, accessibility to waterways was a high priority for our local partners and in Northwest Indiana. Um, so you can see in the first photo here um, on the left, um, this is a, a picture of the construction of an ADA compliant uh, launch canoe and kayak launch on Trail Creek. This was really significant. This was the first in the state um, of these ADA compliant um, paddling launches that was installed. So everyone was really excited to see that go in um, back in 2015. Um, many partners active on, on making that happen. Um, this is a photo courtesy of the Trail Creek Watershed Partnership. Uh, fast forward a little bit to 2018, um, and we have another ADA compliant launch installed at Veterans Park on Deep River in Lake Station. So um, these uh, ADA compliant launches came on board and sort of spread throughout the region, um, gaining more and more momentum to where since 2011, as of 2020, we have eight canoe and kayak launches that have been on installed on various waterways across Northwest Indiana, and six of those are fully ADA compliant. Um, so that's no small feat. Um, the remaining launches have varying degrees of um, ADA compliance um, based on just the site features and limitations that they may have. Um, a little bit more on public accessibility. Um, in the very early days of the Northwest Indiana Partnership, um, another sort of challenge that arose that um, partners decided, hey, maybe Urban Waters could help to advance and tackle this issue. Um, our Northwest Indiana um, Paddling Association had sort of identified the um, East Branch of the Little Calumet River as sort of a hidden gem in Northwest Indiana for paddling. The trouble was as that river went through the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore at that point, now Indiana Dunes National Park, um, the park actually did not allow for um, paddling access and recreational paddling um, on the river through its boundaries. Um, so this was an issue, you know, you could paddle upstream, but once you hit that wall, you wouldn't be able to go through that gem of the actual national park. Um, so a lot of partners got together, uh, sort of led by National Park Service, um, working together with other stakeholders to uh, actually complete an environmental assessment of what would it look like if we were to open the river to paddling within, um, within the National Lakeshore, and finally did develop uh, the National Park Service's River Use and Management Plan, which did then allow paddling on the Little Calumet River within the park boundaries. Um, so this was a big deal <clears throat> to get this accomplished. And, and since that time, um, partners continue uh, working hard together to make sure that that river remains open to paddling, um, both upstream of the park and through the park. Um, this photo on the right, you can see this is a um, canoe and kayak launch installed um, at the Wykes Plampin Nature Preserve in Chesterton by um, one of our Urban Waters partners, Shirley Hines Land Trust. I should also point out that um, in addition to these launches and actually you know, keeping the river open and making sure that it's free of debris so that people can paddle, um, we do have a number of partners, Shirley Hines Land Trust, Save the Dunes, Dunes Learning Center, working together on projects to actually um, acquire and protect land um, along the river corridor um, and also to, to do uh, restoration projects and make sure that the land um, is in good shape. Uh, this is a, a map showing the um, Little Calumet River East Branch Water Trail. This is a National Park Service map, um, but you can kind of see the, the landscape here of the, the actual water trail um, starting from up further into the headwaters of the Little Calumet River, um, and then of course making its way into the National Park. And you can see a number of um, canoe and kayak launches along the way on the river. And one final thing that I'll say about public accessibility is a number of partners are working together just to generally um, increase our partners' capacity to um, safely connect people to um, their waterways. Um, so Northwest Indiana partners, um, you can see on the left, um, we, we did partner with uh, National Park Service and Urban Waters to host a paddle sports safety trainings um, that were um, very well attended. Um, and on the right, you can see students learning about water safety with National Park Service at a Park Kids event at West Beach. And these are just a few examples of um, different trainings and events that we hold to um, connect people to their waterways safely. 
So watershed education, uh, this is another example that can kind of arc back to the beginning of urban waters and progress over time. Um, way back in 2012, one of our um, partners, the LaPorte County Soil and Water Conservation District, um, was the first to host Wilderness Inquiries Canoe Mobile, which if you've never seen it, um, it's a lot of fun. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And you can see it uh, pictured in the photos here. Um, Wilderness Inquiry has a fleet of Voyager canoes, 24 foot Voyager canoes um, that they, they travel around the country with and get students and community members out on their waterways. Um, it's just a great way to <coughs> experience paddling for the first time. These are very secure, <coughs> stable boats that people can get out <coughs> and really directly um, experience their waterways. Um, so fast forward to 2019, in that year, over 6,000 individuals participated in watershed education and paddling events, coordinated both by LaPorte County Soil and Water uh, Conservation District again, and also by our partner Dunes Learning Center, who hosts extensive um, watershed education events throughout Northwest Indiana. Um, so Urban Waters and the local partners do host educational stations on water quality, um, various topics such as um, urban forestry, fisheries, invasive spe species, and more. Um, so it really is a group effort with lots of uh, volunteers and different um, partners and agencies providing those educational opportunities. And I will point out that, you know, it's not cheap to bring this uh, program to Northwest Indiana. Um, so we do try to help our partners identify funding sources to uh, continue that program. Um, in 2019, National Park Service and also a five-star Urban Waters grant did provide partial funding for Canoe Mobile. Um, so these photos here, you can see that's, that is me, myself, the coordinator, Urban Waters coordinator, helping some students look at uh, benthic macroinvertebrates. And over here we have Peg uh, Donnelly, who's a US EPA biologist and a member of our sort of core team, um, teaching students about uh, water quality at Trail Creek. Uh, just a few more notes on watershed education. Of course, the Canoe Mobile program is a big part of that, um, but we have a lot of different partners working on educational initiatives throughout Northwest Indiana. Um, I will point out the Indiana Master Watershed Steward Program, which was piloted in 2019. Um, that is a program that was developed by Illinois Indiana Sea Grant with various urban waters uh, partners contributing modules to that program. Um, so the way that it works is that um, Participants in this Master Watershed Steward Program do participate in a series of training modules on different watershed uh, related topics. And then they are uh, required to complete a certain amount of volunteer hours to become officially certified Master Watershed Stewards. Um, so you can see here on the right, uh, one of the Master Watershed Steward um, participants did organize a um, series of beach cleanups as part of their volunteer work. Um, septic systems, again, uh, one of the very early and, and continued initiatives um, of Northwest Indiana Urban Waters. Um, I will point out that the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Lake Michigan Coastal Program um, does kind of coordinate septic system work here in Northwest Indiana. They do lead uh, what they call a septic system uh, coordinated working group. Um, the previous ambassador, uh, before I came on board, actually did her uh, master's thesis on studying septic systems and effective messaging to homeowners. Um, out of that work, um, Save the Dunes and Lake Michigan Coastal Program did develop and implement a good neighbor outreach campaign, um, as well as the neighborhood ambassador program. So you can see to the right some of the materials developed for that campaign, the Northwest Indiana um, Healthy Septic System Initiative, um, and also some of the Good Neighbor Campaign. Um, they piloted a program where um, individuals put yard signs out um, stating that, you know, I maintain my septic system, I'm a good neighbor. Um, a few other uh, aspects of the septic system work in Northwest Indiana. Um, the Northwest Indiana Regional Planning Commission, also very active in that initiative. Um, doing a lot of work to map where septic systems are located here in Northwest Indiana. And of course, um, Indiana University Northwest partnering on a project to um, currently do some microbial source tracking to get an idea of um, where, um, where we might have uh, issues with septic systems um, not performing properly in Northwest Indiana. 
Um, the community initiative. This is something that I spend quite a bit of my time on these days. It's um, really a high priority for Northwest Indiana Urban Waters. Um, community was an outgrowth of an urban waters partner request for urban forestry support a number of years ago at one of our meetings. Um, so it is an alliance of businesses, not-for-profits, universities, and government agencies working to create a more diverse, healthy, and sustainable urban forest across Northwest Indiana. And this is our community logo, of course, um, the Northwest Indiana Public Service Company, our local utility, um, is very active in community and in the early days did contribute some marketing expertise um, and helped us to um, develop our logo and uh, work on some community branding. Um, community really has um, several different um, aspects working together to achieve our goals. One of those is the Northwest Indiana um, Regional Planning Commission um, does administer a community grant program with funding from US Forest Service, where they make available um, trees to our communities um, by application with the condition that those communities will plant and properly maintain those trees. We do have the Student Conservation Association, which operates a tree team um, that is active um, every year out there um, employing a, about five um, youth in Northwest Indiana per team. Um, so these are, are uh, young adults, I think typically aged like 18 to 24 years um, here in the Northwest Indiana communities of Gary, Hammond, East Chicago, and Whiting. Um, they are out actually planting the trees in our communities, maintaining them, making sure that they stay watered, and also engaging volunteers. Every Saturday in the spring and the fall, um, they are out at parks or schools or um, other areas in our community um, to actually work with volunteers planting, um, planting lots of trees throughout Northwest Indiana. And finally, um, we have the Wildlife Habitat Council, which is um, active. Um, we have obviously a lot of industrial lands in Northwest Indiana. And so Wildlife Habitat Council is out working with our industrial partners to plant trees um, on those lands, often in partnership with um, the industrial employees. Uh, just a few more words about community. So um, we also um, really seek to increase the capacity of our Northwest Indiana partners and communities um, to really um, maintain a, a healthy urban forest. So we've had a number of workshops on uh, various topics that our partners have indicated are of interest to them. Um, topics such as tree planting and maintenance, tree inventories, tree ordinances, pruning, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Tree Steward Program. Um, so we're, we're constantly trying to provide those learning opportunities so we can build that capacity within our communities. Um, the US Forest Service, I believe Sheree Fisher, who's also a part of our core team is, is on the webinar today. Um, she did help us to facilitate the development of a work plan for the community program. Um, so we can kind of have that vision um, and outline of how we're going to work together in the coming years. Um, and finally, um, most recently this past summer, um, we did work with a US uh, Forest Service resource assistant um, who developed a series of um, short videos about the community program that we can use to um, try to engage the community more and spread the word about community. Um, if we have time at the end of the webinar, we might be able to actually um, preview a few of those videos. So in total, since 2016, the community tree um, partners have collectively planted nearly 6,000 trees. We've engaged over 2,000 volunteers, trained 20 youth in urban forestry, worked with over 40 communities, and held 10 trainings on urban forestry topics. Um, next, I'd like to detail some of the different watershed management initiatives here in Northwest Indiana. Um, and this is, this is one where I will give the caveat that efforts to protect and improve waterways in Northwest Indiana are generally led by our local watershed groups. We have some very strong watershed groups operating in Northwest Indiana um, with urban waters um, supporting those efforts. Um, so you can see again the map that I showed earlier showing some of the main tributaries um, in Northwest Indiana. We do have Trail Creek, the Little Calumet River East Branch and Salt Creek, um, Deep River, and of course the Grand Calumet River. Um, I will point out that the item approved watershed management plans in the Lake Michigan watershed can be found on items lamp page and you can see um, 
the website there to access those. So our federal partners um, who are part of um, Urban Waters do support our watershed groups in various ways. And I'll give some very specific examples in the coming slides as they pertain to specific watersheds. But just generally, I, I'd like to point out that, um, you know, some of the efforts by, uh, for example, US Geological Survey, um, they do provide a lot of support on water quality monitoring that is very valuable to our local watershed groups and others um, trying to work at a local level. Um, they have done some work to monitor green infrastructure. You can see the photo here on the right is some of their monitoring equipment at a rain garden that was installed at um, the city of Gary um, City Hall. They've also been very active in bacterial monitoring um, for E. coli and source tracking um, in, in both our, our local beaches and some of our waterways, some of our uh, rivers and tributaries as well. And they do operate a system of real-time monitoring and gauges throughout Northwest Indiana. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, again, they have uh, multiple restoration projects underway um, throughout Northwest Indiana that are very relevant and, and helpful to our local watershed groups trying to um, protect and improve our waterways. And um, another example would be the National uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, they do have agricultural pro uh, programs operating throughout Northwest Indiana. Um, again, very important to, you know, where urban waters is, um, you know, has urban in the name. But of course, we know that the nature of our water bodies here in Northwest Indiana um, do tend to have more rural headwaters. So uh, we definitely work with um, sort of more agricultural and rural communities as well. Um, I do want to say a few words about the Grand Calumet River area of concern. This is not a watershed group, but certainly a geographic area and um, tributary that um, that a lot of partners are working together to restore. Um, the Grand Calumet River uh, was historically one of the most heavily industrialized areas of the country. It was designated as an area of concern under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement of 1987, largely due to legacy pollutants um, a, a heavy industrial past in this area. Um, so many partners, too many uh, to, to actually list on one slide here, are working together with uh, Indiana Department of Environmental Management, US EPA, US Army Corps of Engineers, and many others, um, including not-for-profits um, and, and various other partners to restore the Grand Calumet River area of concern. Um, just a couple of successes. Um, the um, they have completed four large um, Great Lakes Legacy Act sediment remediation projects. So actually um, dredging and, and remediating um, the sediment um, in the Grand Calumet River. Um, there it was work for four habitat restoration management actions that is underway. So uh, restoring some of those habitats along the river, um, including dune and swale. And um, they are still working together to complete all of the management actions required to fully restore the river um, and delist the beneficial use impairments that exist by 2024. Uh, one of the sections that I'd like to highlight of the Grand Calumet um, River work is Jorce Park Beach. Um, this was once considered among the most polluted beaches in the country with up to, I believe, a 70% closure rate. Um, and we've had quite a bit of work uh, in recent years uh, trying to tackle this. The US Geological Survey, as I mentioned, they have done quite a bit of microbial source tracking work at the beach that really sort of pointed the finger towards uh, seagulls um, as a major source of the contamination, the bacterial contamination at that beach. Um, we did have the Army Corps of Engineers working with um, Michigan State University to conduct modeling of what it would look like um, to modify this breakwater present at the beach um, with the idea that water is kind of uh, circulating and stagnating um, along the beach. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, um, that modeling did indicate that there would only be a marginal benefit and improvement in um, bacterial loads for a pretty significant price tag. Um, but, you know, I view that as a success. Better to do the modeling and not spend the millions of dollars for only a minimal impact. Um, coming away from that, um, IDEM and other partners um, are looking at other programs to um, other best management practices that they can employ at the beach to more sustainably manage E. coli and bacterial um, loads. 
Um, I will point out also that the Army Corps of Engineers, the, um, featured in the photos here, you can see the groundbreaking and the restoration um, of a beach re uh, habitat restoration project at Jorce Park Beach. Um, and finally, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management um, has done um, for several years a um, a goal um, deterrent program um, with trained dogs with support from EPA um, to try and manage um, the seagull population at Jorce Park Beach. Um, moving on to the Deep River Watershed. Um, this is an area where the Watershed Management Plan uh, development was led by the Northwest Indiana Regional Planning Commission. They have been um, implementing that plan for several years with a 319 um, funded uh, implementation program um, that was used to install uh, various green infrastructure projects and um, stream restoration projects. Um, they also completed a study of um, the potential modification of a dam on Deep River, um, which I believe that they are hoping to see that project actually move forward rather than fully um, removing that dam, it would be more of a modification um, of that existing dam. I'll also point out that the city of Hobart has been a really active partner and really a, a regional leader in implementing green infrastructure practices. Um, they did complete a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funded project to install multiple green infrastructure projects in the city of Hobart. Um, those include um, rain gardens as, as pictured here on the top, pervious pavement installations, bioswales, native plantings and riparian restoration. The East Branch of the Little Calumet River, and, and this should sound familiar because I, I spoke quite a bit about the East Branch of the Little Calumet River under public accessibility. Um, but this is a watershed where the uh, watershed management plan development was led by Save the Dunes. Um, we have several partners working on land acquisition and cor uh, corridor restoration, uh, Shirley Hines Land Trust, and of course pictured here, the Porter County Isaac Walton League, um, acquiring and protecting and restoring uh, quite a bit of land along the corridor. The Northwest Indiana Paddling Association uh, continues working with partners to open and maintain that um, East Branch of the Little Calumet River water trail so that people can actually connect to their river. Um, and they've also done some work with the uh, Northern Indiana, uh, I'm sorry, Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science on uh, a climate adaptation um, project. Um, we were able to um, work with Shirley Hines Land Trust to host a webinar um, featuring that project that was, was really interested and well attended. Um, I don't have the link here because it just looks like a bunch of numbers and gobbledygook when I paste it in. Um, but if you were to search for the Shirley Hines Land Trust YouTube channel, um, the recording of that webinar is available on their YouTube uh, channel. The Trail Creek Watershed, this is one of the longest uh, standing active watershed groups um, in Northwest Indiana, certainly, and I believe in the state of Indiana. Um, so the Trail Creek Watershed Partnership um, has various partners um, engaged. We do meet um, once a month to um, keep everyone engaged and working together. Um, a couple of key projects that I'll point out, the Michigan City Sanitary uh, District um, in the past year did complete the remediation of a former unregulated dump um, at the Carwick uh, Park uh, Nature Preserve site. And um, at an adjacent site, um, they did um, recently complete a wetland project at the Cheney Run um, confluence with Trail Creek. So um, a project there to um, manage stormwater coming off of the Cheney Run watershed. Um, you can see at the top photo, um, some of our members of the Trail Creek Watershed Partnership touring the remediation of that Carwick uh, Park nature site um, as the remediation was underway. Um, I mentioned under the watershed education uh, section that uh, the LaPorte County Soil and Water Conservation District was the one to sort of spearhead um, the canoe mobile, the Wilderness Inquiry canoe mobile program. And um, of course, so they're very active in bringing that program to Trail Creek with what they call Trail Creek Week. Um, an offshoot of that that they actually developed was 
um, something called the Michigan City Wolves um, High School Environmental Restoration Team. So that's a group of high school students who um, get out and, and paddle on Trail Creek, but also are active in um, projects to restore the creek. You can see uh, a member of the team over here on in the lower picture, removing invasive species there at Hanson Park. And finally, a, a number of other projects underway by partners, including stream stabilization and bioswale installations by both our Michigan City and LaPorte County parks. And I, I would like to just point out, um, you can see here in this photo, the um, sort of lower center photograph that is uh, Nicole Massacre, who is with the LaPorte County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, Urban Waters did nominate her for um, a River Hero Award nomination, um, which she did receive in 2018 to kind of highlight her work with um, the Michigan City um, Environmental Restoration Team and other projects. Um, so finally, just a few words about my role as Urban Waters Coordinator and how I can, you know, hopefully if, if you're listening to this and you're not familiar with Urban Waters, but you'd like to get engaged, um, please reach out to me and, and hopefully there are ways that I can um, help your organization and help connect you to the Urban Waters um, network. Um, so I do facilitate, as I mentioned previously, uh, the development of our collaborative um, work plan um, and the implementation of that plan. Um, I do, a lot of my time is spent trying to communicate the local needs of our partners um, and our local projects to our federal partners so that they're aware of them and they can provide um, assistance um, as available and appropriate. Um, I do work to connect partners to federal opportunities and resources. Um, Urban Waters, you know, in and of itself does not come with, you know, a, a big price tag that we, we can just give out money, but I do spend a lot of time trying to share um, grant opportunities that I become aware of with our partners. That is consistently the most clicked section of um, my e-newsletter is the funding opportunities. So just to give you an idea, in 2019, um, our partners did secure nearly $3 million in grants. And I do point out as kind of a caveat that Urban Waters very directly assisted in more than $600,000 of that. Um, but really, again, the work um, very much driven by our local partners working to um, secure those funds. And of course, I, I call myself a cheerleader for Northwest Indiana, um, always working to celebrate our partnership successes and highlight the, the hard work of all of our Northwest Indiana partners. Um, I do send, as I mentioned, a monthly e-newsletter. We have over 480 subscribers to that um, e-newsletter. Um, I also send special opportunity alerts as needed, making people aware of uh, funding opportunities, webinars, um, training opportunities, and things of that nature. Um, so I do include meeting reminders, projects updates, funding and learning opportunities, and other resources. Um, so if you're interested um, in joining the Northwest Indiana Urban Waters list to get those updates, um, you can utilize this text to join by texting Urban Waters to 22828. And of course, I have my contact information at the um, end of the presentation, and you're welcome to reach out to me with any questions um, or to ask to subscribe. And with that, I will go ahead and conclude my remarks. And um, I would like to thank Lynn again for kind of co-presenting with me today. And thank you to Michael and Item for um, offering this opportunity. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for um, all the work you put into this presentation, Jennifer and, um, and Lynn. Um, if anybody on the line here has a question, you can either go down to the bottom of your screen and the little button that says chat, you could type your message into the chat window. Otherwise, you can also go down to the bottom and uh, on the left hand side, there's a mute unmute button. You can feel free to um, express your question verbally if you'd like. While we're, go while we're waiting for um, folks to um, find the, the chat and the um, mute, unmute buttons, I do have a quick question for you. Um, I find that with a lot of our programs, um, you know, people aren't always um, 
clear on every aspect of the, the program or whatnot. Um, I guess, Jennifer, what do you find are sort of the points that um, you get the most questions about or, um, or, or the, you find that there's the most confusion about with urban waters? Sure, and and you know I will also point out um, that we do have some members of our our core team that that co leads urban waters here on the call. We do have Sheree Fisher with U.S. Forest Service, of course Lynn Westfall with Forest Service, and Linda Lancaster with National Park Service. So I would just encourage them to um, chime in with any of their thoughts. Um, but from from my perspective, a, a couple of things. One is you hear the name urban waters, right? Um, and, and the focus certainly of urban waters is to work in these urban communities and revitalize our communities and our urban waterways. Um, but we know that um, water um, doesn't obey our jurisdictional boundaries. Um, so we do work quite a bit, as I mentioned, with uh, the National Natural Resource Conservation Service and other um, agencies, the Soil and Water Conservation District. We are not limited to just the urban communities. Um, we do work in some of those headwater areas, um, and it, we really don't keep a hard um, boundary. Um, you know, in the past, we've we've had some conversations about um, the boundaries of what we consider Northwest Indiana urban waters, and in our working area, um, when our partners south of the Lake Michigan watershed into the Kankakee River Basin um, need our assistance, we work with them as well. Um, so, so it's not just limited to the kind of urban areas. We also work throughout Northwest Indiana um, in other areas. Um, another thing that I would note, I think, you know, in the very early days of urban waters in Northwest Indiana, um, you know, when, when things were just getting started, I think people were unclear uh, to a certain extent about the program and, you know, what are you coming in to do? Are you going to direct us what to do? And I think um, even before my time, uh, the federal partners uh, did a really good job of demonstrating that, um, you know, we want this to be, um, you know, locally led. This is a federal partnership, but we're working with the local communities. We're working with the nonprofits and the municipalities and the state government. Um, so not a, a top-down approach. We're not coming in and setting the priorities. Um, we're coming in to work together with the communities um, and, and try to add value and advance their priorities together. Thank you, Jennifer. Did, um, did anybody else have um, any questions um, for Jennifer or the other Urban Waters partners that are on the call right now? I have a question if nobody else does. Yes. Um, what does an ADA compliant ramp boat launch system look like? How does it work? Sure, great question. Um, you know, and I wonder if I can go back. I'm not sure if any of my slides actually um, show the, the different features, but I will try maybe sharing that so that so we can take a look while I answer that question. Yeah, I couldn't tell. I didn't know if there was like a sling system to actually lift people out of their wheelchair and sling them over into a boat or just what? <laughs> Yeah, I believe generally, and let me make my way back to that slide. I believe generally there is um, sort of a system where individuals can um, sort of use a railing system. Yeah, there's not a great photo of it here, but I will share share this for what it's worth. Oops. I can help you out, Jen. Too. This, this is Lynn. I can chime in a bit here. It depends. There are a number of different levels of accessibility uh, that a kayak or canoe launch might have. Um, one of the ones near Miller Beach has a bench that allows a wheelchair user to transfer to the bench and then move themselves down and into the boat. Um, sometimes they're even simpler than that. Uh, so it varies by um, type of boat launch 
and we've got different types throughout the region. Yeah, I was just curious how someone would get from a wheelchair into a kayak. So on the this is Linda on the on the boat launches, like Lynn said, they're at various different levels. But several of the ones that we call ADA compliant, when you you go down to the launch, there's a bench sitting there, but the bench has two slide out trays, and depending on whether you're getting into a kayak or a canoe you slide out one tray or the other. And then you just transfer yourself from the wheelchair onto the bench, onto the slide out and into the vessel. Um, and, and Zuli had put down over at the one at Marquette Park, she had a um, Hoyer lift. I don't know if it's still there or not for people who, um, who couldn't even transfer themselves um, into the vessels. And wow, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for, for chiming in to help me um, answer that. And, and we are fortunate to have um, Zuli Alvarado, who is active in our partnership and, um, you know, really advocates for accessibility. And she's always quick to point out that, you know, accessibility means different things for, for different people. Um, so, it, you know, it's always a, a balancing act depending on the different sites that we have, um, you know, how you um, make sure that things are, are accessible, um, you know, the path to, to get there, as well as the features at, at the site. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, um, Linda and Lynn, for, for chiming in there. I'm just yeah. going to add one more thing. This is Linda again. I'm just not as limber as I used to be, and using that, um, that uh, facility, because you you put your boat in on these rollers and then you put yourself in and instead of tipping over and falling in, which is what I typically do in a kayak, I can put myself in there and then pull myself out. So just for the aging population or for people who are not really familiar with how to get in and out of a boat, it makes it really nice. Just wanted to point that out. It's not, it's not only for people who are, um, are wheelchair bound. That's a great point, I agree. Yep. And, and this is Lynn, one other thing too, if folks on the call don't know, I think it's at the Douglas Center, Linda will correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Indiana Dunes National Park does have at least a small collection of accessible recreation equipment for loan. Um, we do. Sand, uh, wheelchairs that can go on sand, um, bicycles that can be ridden on in the fronts so of your blind, you can still go for a bike ride. Um, yep. If you've got someone to pedal you, things like that. So there's even more accessibility than just these kayak launches. Thanks, Lynn. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions for Jennifer or the other Urban Waters partners on the call today? I have another question if nobody else does. Who is on the EPA contact? Peg Donnelly. Sure. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Peg Donnelly. Thank you. Yes, and I could um, provide her contact uh, information. Um, I'll, I'll try to post it in the chat here, but um, yes, Peg Donnelly is our um, contact with US EPA. Um, I believe her position is she's a biologist with um, US EPA uh, Region 5. So she's um, one of the co-leads um, of our location here in Northwest Indiana, um, but also works with kind of the Urban Waters Federal Partnership uh, leadership at EPA and um, other urban waters locations in our region. I have another question if nobody else does. Um, do you get or do much work with the folks in the Gary area? Yes, we do work quite a bit with um, the city of Gary is listed as one of our partners. Um, we work quite a bit with um, the city of Gary, um, their um, sanitary district and um, their, um, their kind of green team. Um, Brenda Scott Henry is sort of our main contact at the city of Gary. Um, and actually I see that Ashley Overton, I believe with uh, city of Gary is here on the call. Um, they are doing a lot of work in the city of Gary to um, promote green infrastructure. As I mentioned, um, 
a couple of years back that um, rain garden was installed at City Hall. There was a, a large project done there to um, sort of com really completely retrofit um, an area where an old building came down and modify the parking lot to um, the City Hall and install um, a, a pretty extensive rain garden um, that US Geological Survey then did help to monitor. Um, but they have a number of other projects um, I, I do participate in their um, green infrastructure um, te working team that, that meets regularly. Um, they've had um, a project called Vacant to Vibrant, um, where they have taken um, a series of um, vacant lots within the city and um, sort of modified those lots to meet community needs and also meet st um, some stormwater goals, installing um, rain gardens in those areas. Um, and any of my other Urban Waters um, partners or, or Ashley yourself, if anyone would like to chime in, um, you're welcome to do so. But yeah, they've been a very um, active and important um, partner um, in Urban Waters. I'll also point out that the community initiative that I detailed quite a bit in my um, presentation, um, one of the focus communities of that Student Conservation Association tree planting team um, is the city of Gary. So they've done quite a bit of tree plantings at um, parks and schools throughout the city of Gary. Um, many of our initiatives such as the um, canoe mobile um, program um, does operate at locations in the city of Gary as well. If nobody else has a question, where do your trees come from for the tree planting projects? That is a great question. Um, currently, um, most of the community program is um, supported with funds from US Forest Service um, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, we do um, obtain the, the trees for that program from generally two nurseries um, that are located in our region. Um, they're very high quality um, trees. They're, um, you know, not just tiny saplings. They're, they're generally one to one and a half inch caliper trees. Um, they're all native um, trees to Northwest Indiana. Um, so typically those um, are ordered, NERPC, the Northwest Indiana Regional Planning Commission will place an order twice a year, once in the spring and once in a fall for their sort of grant distribution, distribution program. Um, and then partners um, who are awarded trees will attend a training um, workshop where they are able to pick up their trees for planting. Um, and I believe the Student Conservation Association goes through typically those same two um, nurseries to obtain their trees, um, which they then um, plant in those communities throughout um, Gary, Hammond, East Chicago and Whiting. Does that answer your question? Oh, yes, thank you. We probably have time for one more question. If anybody's got a burning question they'd like to ask. Okay, hearing none, I'd just like to thank um, Jennifer and, and Lynn and the other Urban Waters partners who chimed in to help answer questions today um, for their time. Um, and uh, just a note to everybody, a reminder that if you go to the Lake Michigan webinar series webpage that I, po I posted in the chat, um, that um, give it a, a week or so and we'll have the recording um, and the slides for this webinar up on that page. And be sure to tune in to the other um, forthcoming webinars because there are a lot of interesting topics and a lot of great speakers yet to come. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for the opportunity. We're always happy to share about Northwest Indiana Urban Waters.